Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 716 for the 26th of June 2022. Richard Saunders coming to you this week once again from the beautiful state of Oregon here in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Always on the lookout for Bigfoot, but only finding very nice local beers, I must say. I'm not a Bigfoot hunter, I'm a beer hunter. Coming up on this week's show, I read a piece I wrote for a group in Peru all about the irrational beliefs in Australia, and included in this week's show notes is a link for the original Spanish version of the item I'm about to read. So I wrote this with people from South America in mind, talking about irrational beliefs in Australia, but I sort of figure people around the world might find this interesting. Following that, it's the book of Tim with Tim Mendham. This week, Tim Mendham looks at the life and times of James Usher. Now, James Usher was the cleric who sort of calculated using biblical references, timelines and family trees, that sort of thing, what he considered to be the age of the earth, which dated back to something like 4,000, I mean, BC in that area. And he is still being used today as a reference by creationists. This is a very interesting article written by Martin Bridgestock, all about how Usher came to his conclusions and his impact on creationist thought. Very interesting. Those of you who follow the creationism debate, which isn't as big as it used to be, in Australia at least, I think you'll find this item about James Usher very interesting. Then to round off the show, it's once more back to the digital archives at Trove, looking at the Sunday Mail from Brisbane, the Canberra Times, the Daily Telegraph, dating from the 1930s all the way to the 1990s, oddball stories, strange stories about the paranormal and the supernatural, just Things I couldn't quite define any other way, but oddball. Stay tuned at the end of the show for more announcements from me. But now it's time for me to run downstairs and have some leftover nachos. Mmm, nachos with a bit of bit of jalapenos. Yum. Okay, well, I do that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Recently, I was asked to write a story a report for the Peruvian rationalists, humanists, or Hura Peru, H-U-R-A Peru. And so I sat down and had a thought and came up with something about the, uh, the state of the paranormal or the irrational beliefs in Australia. And this has been published. And it was published on Saturday the 9th of May at Neo Skepsis, and I will link to this site in this week's show notes. And the important thing is it's been published in Spanish. I wrote it in English, and it's been translated so Spanish-speaking people, especially in South America, can read what I have to say about the paranormal here in Australia. So I thought I would read it out here on the Skeptic Zone, and I will add a link in this week's show notes to the Peruvian rationalists and humanists and a link to the item in Spanish. Why is it that far away places invoke a certain amount of mystery? Growing up in Australia, I remember hearing of places in South America and thinking what a strange and wonderful land it must be, full of mystery and adventure and unexplainable phenomena. Maybe even supernatural events or strange animals unknown to science, not forgetting the reports of UFOs, together with the truly awe-inspiring Nazca lines of Peru. Were they really made by ancient aliens? I wonder if 
People in South America, when they think of Australia, also imagine a land full of mystery and strange animals. Well, yes, Australia does seem to have more than enough of its fair share of strange animals, but they are very real. It's an interesting fact that our famous duck-billed platypus, an animal so strange it was once thought to be a practical joke, something stitched together from odds and ends, has fossil ancestors that can be found in South America. Yes, our lands were once joined some 60 million years ago. But is Australia truly a land of mystery and wonders? Well, I can only say, yes, it is. We are the land of the oldest living culture in the world, that of the indigenous peoples, and have natural wonders from the coast to the desert and great modern cities to rival any in the world. However, like many other countries, Australia too has no end of paranormal, supernatural, and pseudoscientific claims. Let's start with those animals. You might think that we here in Australia would have no need to invent strange animals. Apart from the duck-billed platypus, we have the kangaroo, the koala, no end of venomous spiders and snakes, but somehow, for many people, all those are not enough. So, we also have our very own version of Bigfoot, known here as the Yowie, a strange ape-like beast that, like its North American cousin, has yet to be proven to exist. But that doesn't stop many people over the decades reporting that they have not only seen it, but sometimes have even made plaster casts of its footprints. Can it be that we are jealous of North America? Maybe, but unknown animals or cryptids are reported all over the world, so in that sense, Australia is nothing special. And thinking of animals in the countryside reminds me of one of the oldest and most beloved of what we might call irrational phenomena in Australia, that being water divining or water dowsing. The belief that people can find hidden underground water with rods or twigs dates back thousands of years, long before European farmers arrived in Australia. But as much of the country is dry, and even the green areas can suffer from droughts, it is not at all surprising that this practice has been part of life in the regional areas for hundreds of years. It is also the claim that has been tested more than any other by the Australian sceptics. Even the late James the Amazing Randy made a special trip to Australia in 1980 to conduct a large-scale test of local diviners. Luckily for us, the event was filmed for TV and is now available on YouTube. It is a classic example of not only James Randi in action, but a lesson in investigation for the rest of us. Of course, any trip to the countryside gives you the opportunity to gaze up at the night sky and see the same stars as you would do in South America. But while you enjoy the view... Keep an eye out for alien spaceships that are reported flying about our skies. Do you know that some claim there is a secret underground base in the middle of Australia where the US government conducts experiments on alien robots? We also have UFO organizations for those wishing to connect with like-minded people and swap stories of close encounters. Other aspects of irrational thinking that is part of life in Australia are the many many types of alternative medicine on offer. We have homeopaths, iridologists, acupuncturists, even some vets do this, and people using strange devices that use energy, vibrations, and frequencies. Homeopathy, for example, can be found on the shelves of most pharmacies together with other unproven therapies. Again, it seems that Australia is nothing special as these so-called healing modalities are common in many parts of the world. Ghosts are everywhere. We have haunted houses. In fact, more than one house lays claim to being Australia's most haunted. Strange apparitions seen in graveyards and things that go bump in the night. 
feel like an adventure? Then join a team of ghost hunters as they use their night vision cameras and audio gear in the hopes of capturing a real spirit. Some years ago, I visited a local graveyard in Sydney with a paranormal investigation team as they tried to find the spirits of the long dead. And speaking of the dead, do you feel like you want to talk with your dead grandmother? Australia has mediums, psychics and others claiming paranormal powers that are very happy to help you contact those in the afterlife. Morning TV shows feature readings of audience members, magazines carry advice and insights from the other side, and live stage shows of Talking to the Dead are a feature of clubs. Paranormal and pseudoscientific beliefs, irrational thoughts and behaviours, such as the ones I've mentioned, are as common in Australia as they might be in other countries around the world. But we are often compared to the USA and the UK, and to be honest, we are similar in many respects. I would find just as many psychics, mystics, tarot card readers in those countries as in Australia. Where Australia differs from many other parts of the world is when it comes to religious claims such as miracles. Be sure we do have such claims, but they are rare. Religion as a whole has never been the social movement in Australia that we see in other parts of the world. A key example is that in Australia, someone running for political office, even the Prime Minister, does not have to mention God, gods, faith, and such like. He or she can have no religion, and largely, no one cares. Could you imagine this happening in some other parts of the world? It is often said that no one in the USA, for example, could ever hope to be elected if they were an atheist or even agnostic. Australia is a faraway land of wonder and mystery. We have so much wonder and mystery that we really don't need to invent any more. But that is what humans do regardless. Yes, we have more than enough irrational beliefs in this country, but we also have a strong sceptical community headed up by Australian sceptics. The great tug of war between reason and unreason continues in the faraway land of kangaroos and maybe, just maybe, the odd yowie or two. And once again, you can read that report in Spanish. And I hope my South American listeners will head to this page. And it's the Peruvian rationalist humanists. And I will link to that page so you can enjoy that in Spanish in this week's show notes. Hi, this is Susan Gerbeck from GSOW. That's Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. I want to thank everyone who, via the Skeptic Zone podcast, has contacted me to become an editor on Wikipedia. Together, we have worked on or created over 1,200 Wikipedia pages. Countless thousands of people all over the world access those pages each day. In fact, we're over 52 million page views. Like many listeners, I also give back to the Skeptic Zone via monthly micropayments, and I want to encourage you to do the same. Is the information and entertainment you get each week from the show worth five or ten dollars a month? I sure think it is. Follow the link at skepticzone.tv and show your practical support. Thank you. And now. A reading from the Book of Tim with Tim Mendham. Hi, my name's Tim Mendham. I'm Executive Officer for Australian Skeptics Inc. and I'm the editor of our magazine, The Skeptic. 
today I'll be reading an article from the September 2018 issue of the magazine, which is volume 38, number 3. And you can download the whole issue for free from our website, skeptics.com.au. This particular article is called The Man Who Dated the World and Got It Wrong. It's written by Martin Bridgestock, who is a life member of Australian Skeptics, and it's about... Uh, someone who is a patron, if you like, or a patron saint of young earth creationists. And more will be revealed as we go through it. Now Martin starts off his article by saying, when my mother passed away, she left me an old Bible published in 1899. The interesting feature is that it has a chronology of the world in the margins. For example, we are told that God created the world in 4004 BC, that Noah's flood began in 2349 BC, and that Moses parted the Red Sea in 1491 BC. There is evidence of a kind backing these numbers. There is also a mass of scholarly work carried out by one of the sharpest minds of his day. In this article, I want to understand this man's thinking and how he came to his conclusions. James Usher, and that's Usher with two S's, by the way, 1581 to 1656, was born into an Irish Protestant family. For his whole life, he was both a devout Anglican clergyman and a first-rate scholar, eventually becoming Archbishop of Armagh. Anglicans in Ireland were in a strange position. The London government strongly disapproved of Roman Catholicism and supported the Church of Ireland. However, most Irish, the vast majority, clung to their traditional faith and hated the Protestant heresy. Usher became heavily involved in Catholic-Protestant disputes. He wrote long tomes of biblical and historical analysis. His total collected works run to 17 volumes. In addition, Usher took part in debates with Catholic opponents. Perhaps his most sensational confrontation took place in 1625 at the Northamptonshire home of Lord John and Lady Elizabeth Mordaunt. The Mordaunts had a problem. Lord John was a Catholic, while Lady Elizabeth was a Protestant. They both took their religion seriously. The couple finally agreed that each would appoint a champion to argue for them in a debate. One of them would then convert. Lady Mordaunt chose Usher as her champion. Lord John chose a well-known Jesuit who went by the name of Beaumont. Though his real name was Rookwood, he may have changed it because he was the brother of one of the gunpowder plotters. That's the one who was included, Guy Fawkes. Martin says that uh, I have taken part in debates against fanatical opponents, so I know that it is astonishingly difficult to secure a clear win. In this debate, Usher went first. He spoke for a total of three days, outlining his thesis that the current Catholic Church was not at all like the original Christian Church and that the Church of England was a far better claimant to be the true Church of God. As his argument rolled remorselessly on, Beaumont became more and more distressed. Finally, on the fourth day, it was Beaumont's turn to speak. and Nobody could find him. Then a note was discovered, apologising and saying that he'd forgotten all his arguments. He had run away. Lord John Morden kept his word and converted to Anglicanism. Much later, he became one of the few aristocrats to side with Parliament early in the Civil War. Lady Morden never forgot what Usher had done and her gratitude later saved his life. Now, what links all this to the age of the earth? Usher spent 18 years studying the early writings of the church. In these early days, the proponents of Christianity were taunted by non-Christians who argued that the new faith had no roots in history. The Christian answer was to appropriate the Jewish holy book and to incorporate it into the Christian Bible, calling it the Old Testament. This gave Christianity a history going back literally to the creation of the world. It also suggested tantalisingly that the creation could be dated. In the Old Testament, there are long strings of begats, along with the ages of the begatters, chronicling thousands of years of history. Usher set to work on this problem of dating. He had to make sure that his evidence was as reliable as possible, so he scrupulously compared various translations of the Bible, including Hebrew, Samaritan and Greek versions. He could work in all these languages. He heard of a Chaldean translation somewhere in the Middle East and sent an agent to acquire it. While the agent was working, Usher studied Chaldean so that he was ready to examine it. After years of work, Usher concluded that the Hebrew version was most reliable, so he used that. 
Usher spent years working on his chronology and looked like failing. Using the lists of begats in the Old Testament and the ages of the fathers, he compiled a chronology several thousand years long, beginning with Adam and ending up among the later Old Testament prophets, but without a fixed point. He needed to anchor this floating chronology in historical time. It was here that Usher made his crucial breakthrough. He noticed what had eluded other scholars. In the second book of Kings, he saw an incident which occurred during the captivity of Israel in Babylon. Quote, And it came to pass in the seven and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, out of prison. That's the second book of Kings 25-27. Usher knew that evil Merodach was the son of King Nebuchadnezzar. In his encyclopedic reading, he had come across a list of kings and their dates, compiled by the mathematician and scientist Ptolemy in the first century CE. This included the date of Nebuchadnezzar's death. Usher took Ptolemy's date and converted it into a modern calendar, concluding that Nebuchadnezzar had died in 562 BC. That gave his chronology a fixed point in time. Working back through his lists, Usher computed that the world had been created 3,442 years before the death of Nebuchadnezzar. Adding the two numbers gave 4004 BC as the date of creation, which is nicely neat, isn't it? Usher wasn't finished, though. He noted that there was ripe fruit in the Garden of Eden. Uh -huh. Clearly, this meant that creation took place in the northern autumn, and symmetry suggested that this would be during the autumn solstice. But Usher also noted a strange characteristic of a verse in Genesis. It ran, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Genesis 1.5. Usher noted that morning usually comes before the evening, so this had to mean that the earth was created the evening before the first full day. Symmetry suggested that the time was 6pm. So after all his labours, Usher triumphantly concluded that the world had been created at 6pm on Saturday, October 27th, 4004 BC. Armed with his conclusions, Usher set out to do what no scholar could possibly have done before him. He set out to write a history of the world with correct dates. However, events now turned against him. He travelled to England and became chaplain to King Charles I. The Civil War, 1642-51, to 51, ensued and Usher lost his position. His papers were scattered while he avoided the war Then his king was defeated and he was left essentially destitute. Further, the Cromwell government was not well disposed to the king's ex-chaplain and was considering action against him. Luckily, a past good deed came back to help him. Lady Elizabeth Mordaunt was now the Dowager Lady Peterborough. Her late husband's support for Parliament gave her great prestige. She sheltered Usher in her London residence and he avoided prosecution. Visitors to the house remember him as a tall, courteous, kindly person. He was now an old man, driven by his desire to write his great history of the world. So each day he would find a well-lit place in the house, set up his table and papers and write. While engaged on his task, Usher saw from the roof of Lady Peterborough's house the execution of Charles I. The event shook him deeply, but he was able to continue with his great task. What did eventually stop him was age and infirmity. He completed the second volume of his history, taking the reader up to 70 CE, the year when the Romans stormed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, but he had to stop there. He died in 1656, and the second volume was published posthumously. After Usher's death, he was widely praised. Even his opponents paid tribute to his personal kindness and profound scholarship. Oliver Cromwell organised a state funeral, and Usher was buried in Westminster Abbey. What ensured Usher's fame, however, was when Thomas Guy, a successful publisher who also endowed Guy's Hospital, used the chronology in an edition of the Bible. The use of the dates was common until the end of the 19th century, which is when Martin's Bible was published. Of course, Usher's dating system was hideously, ludicrously wrong. The Earth is actually more than 700,000 times older than Usher's estimate, and yet at the time, 
Usher's chronology was not regarded as strange or eccentric. Other scholars, such as Sir Walter Raleigh and Oxford Vice-Chancellor John Lightfoot, also made estimates, and their figures were similar to Usher's. How could such a keen, well-informed mind be so terribly wrong? A short answer is that there was no adequate way of dating the past back then. It cannot be observed directly. All we can do is look at what is currently observable and make deductions. Like many people, Usher accepted the Bible as a reliable source of knowledge, and so all his learning and reasoning led him into a useless dead end. Usher was not an obscurantist like the modern creation scientists. He simply had no other source of information. It should be clear that Usher was quite different from the evolution deniers who regard him as some sort of patron saint. By the standards of his day, he was a highly regarded scholar. He took care with his evidence and worked hard to make sure it was the best available. Some of his findings, such as the dating of Nebuchadnezzar's death and his judgment that the Hebrew Bible was the most reliable, still stand today. On the other hand, new ways of thinking about the past soon began to appear. Within a few decades of Usher's death, observers were starting to think quite differently about the age of the earth. Edward Lude, 1660-1709, was a Welsh scientist. He noted that rocks occasionally fell from the sides of Lamberis Pass, in North Wales, and came to rest on the valley floor. Lute heard from the locals that such falls only happened two or three times in a lifetime, and so he counted boulders and estimated that the earth was perhaps 200,000 to 300,000 years old. A little later, the Comte de Buffon, 1707-1788, performed experiments on the cooling of hot metal balls of various sizes. He tried to extrapolate to the earth, allowing for the insulation effect of its crust and atmosphere, ending with an age of 74,832 years. The theological outcry made him keep secret his personal estimate of about 10 million years. Now, both Lude and Buffon were wrong, but we can begin to see the emergence of people thinking about the age of the Earth in a recognisably scientific way. Better estimates would follow, converging on the current estimate of an Earth which is 4.6 billion years old, in a universe perhaps three times that age. Instead of ridiculing Usher, a charitable reaction is to regard him as a man of his day, an estimable scholar, and apparently a good man. That article is from The Skeptic, September 2018, which is volume 38, number 3. And as I said, you can download that copy of the magazine for free from our website. And while you're there, you might subscribe to the magazine as well, because the four most recent issues you can't download for free. This is Brian Dunning. As part of National Science Week in Australia, Canberra Skeptics will be hosting a free screening of my latest documentary, Science Friction. This will be on Sunday, the 14th of August at 1 p.m. at King O'Malley's Pub, 131 City Walk in Canberra. So what is it all about? Well, you know those TV documentaries you see and the science experts they feature? Did you know that producers often edit them out of context and twist their words to make it seem like they promoted some pop sensationalism instead of the real facts? Science friction exposes this practice and gives the scientists a chance to clear the record. You will be shocked to see how the media can twist their words and intent. That's Sunday, the 14th of August at 1 p.m. at King O'Malley's Pub. For further information about this free event, please visit CanberraSkeptics.org. Thank you, and I hope you all raise a glass to help promote science and truth-telling in the media. I know I certainly will. And please enjoy the film.
once again to dive into those pages at Trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia. And what a resource it is! Digitised newspapers, gazettes, journals, all sorts of things going back many, many, many decades, indeed into the past centuries, about as long as you can go back here in Australia with a newspaper. And in keeping with our general theme of looking up paranormal, supernatural and related subjects, I just ran a general search and look for maybe the odd side. Maybe they're all odd. The stranger side when it comes to the paranormal. And our first random return comes from the Sunday Mail, Brisbane, Queensland, dated the 17th of December, 1937. Ghost ordered off the streets. The ghost of the late Sir Arthur Conan Doyle has been ordered by a New York judge to stop parading through the streets on the grounds that he, or it, was blocking the footpaths and parading without a permit. The ruling was delivered to Mrs. Elizabeth O'Hare, a tall, white-haired woman who explained that she was the personal representative of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's ghost on earth. Mrs. O'Hare, known amongst the occult as Elizabeth the Transcriber, was taken to court after she had marched down Fifth Avenue with a huge banner challenging Mr. Joseph Dunninger, a noted spook debunker, to debate with Sir Arthur's ghost on the question of whether spirits of the dead can return to the earth. Mr. Dunninger had offered £2,000 to anyone who could produce a ten-word code, which, he said, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle gave him before he died. Mrs. O'Hare answered with her challenge. She disclaimed personal responsibility for the parade. It was Conan Doyle's spirit, she said. I had no choice in the matter. The judge rubbed his chin and said he had no desire to set himself up as a judge of the supernatural. There is a great deal about psychic matters that I do not know, he pointed out. You bet there is, chimed in Mrs. O'Hare. I mean, said the judge, flushing slightly, that I don't know much about ghosts. I know about the lore, however, and I would advise you to stop parading and handing out pamphlets. When told that she would go to jail, if she offended again, Mrs. O'Hare sighed and promised to obey the law. Later, she told reporters that she gave the undertaking on the advice of Abraham Lincoln, who was with me in the courtroom, advising me right along. She then added that Lincoln's spirit would be reincarnated soon. So there you go. All the way back in 1937, that would have been an interesting day in court. And now what, what other random craziness can we find from the Canberra Times dated the 2nd of March 1991? So, leaping forward many decades. And this is from Michelin Busico in San Francisco. Kidnap victims of ETs. Tell all under hypnosis. They're out there removing brains, taking women's eggs, creating a hybrid race. Tiny creatures with giant heads. Giant creatures with tiny heads. Creatures with heads like honeydew melons. They've all been there, sneaking through the sky in spacecraft, vacuuming up earthlings, poking and probing us in unspeakable ways or so we've been told, they're aliens, extraterrestrials, the little green men. And they've been getting away with it for eons because we poor humans don't remember the encounters. Either the memories are so horrible we repress them, or the tricky extraterrestrials make us forget. But we've been evolving too. Now ufologists like psychologist Edith Fiora have a way to make us remember. Hypnotize abductees. And they talk. Actually, they talk their heads off, going on for hours in a single session, telling of cruising alien ships, 
ETs taking them on board. And not all the experiences are bad. San Francisco Bay Area abductees have told Fiora about aliens curing ailments from yeast infections to cancer. Fiora herself remembered, under hypnosis, being abducted in 1980. The aliens beamed her up from her bedroom in Los Gatos, California, one night and showed her around their spaceship. It was just a typical roundish interior, kind of shiny low lights, she says. I wasn't frightened at all. But then she knew what to expect. Fiora has compiled 13 case histories of abductees into a book, Encounters, in which she also explains how to tell if you have been taken. Indications are gaps of time you can't account for, marks on your body you can't explain, or dreams about UFOs or extraterrestrials. Fiora lists 25 other hypnotists who work with abductees in her book. Eleven of them are in the Bay Area around San Francisco. Local abductees can call in reports to a UFO hotline based in Menlo Park, California. Those who've gone up and those who study them say abductions follow a pattern. It's night. They're alone. There's a bright light. Then suddenly, a pack of aliens. Standard issue ETs are short, around 130 centimeters, and that's just over four feet. With big heads, light gray skin, no hair, slender bodies, and a silver jumpsuit or something of the sort, Fiora says. Virgil Staff, chairman of an organization of UFO watchers, said, There's not much known about the feet. Witnesses frequently say they couldn't see feet. The abductee is sucked into a spaceship. The preferred vehicles for the Bay Area aliens are saucers, though some ships look like balls of fire, staff says. Then they are given a physical examination that requires many probes. Fiora said, They are examined in every orifice of their body by a number of these aliens. Staff says things have been quiet in the Bay Area lately. There were two reports in November, two in December, and one in January. But for every abductee we learn about, he said, there are dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands we don't know about. Some of the ETs have been compassionate, but the typical story is the abductees are treated like laboratory animals. Diane Tay, mother of two, Chinese herb distributor and Cosmic Frequent Flyer explains about the aliens who've been dropping by for more than 20 years. Ever since they've planted something in her brain, she's been able to contact them whenever she likes. They call her sometimes too, with advice or information about the future. In her most vivid memory, gentle, big-headed aliens took her from her bedroom. I remember dark eyes bigger eyes and more slanted eyes, she said. Not real crazy like in some pictures, more gentle. They were tall and thin and had bigger heads, but just slightly. They did not communicate through words. First, she found herself in a cold room with a brilliant blue light that had something to do with killing bacteria. Then came an examination. They were very interested in taking all kinds of blood, making analysis and laboratory workups. She said, There was a machine over my head for some time. I felt as though something had been put into my mind. There was something going on there. They also cut inside things that were going in through my abdomen, and I didn't have any anesthesia. It wasn't such a bad experience, she says, Afterwards, they took her into a round auditorium with 200 other people. A giant screen flashed picture after picture of scenes from Earth. Ocean, sky, smokestacks, people in hospitals. She became inspired to help people take care of themselves and to become better caretakers of the planet. After, it was like I had a sense of purpose. She said, Like, yeah, now I know now what I'm supposed to do. 
James Harder, a civil engineering professor at the University of California, Berkeley, says feelings of being on a mission are a common result of interplanetary chats. Alien encounters are his advocation. He's been collecting data for 30 years and has interviewed more than 300 abductees, including Fiora. He says 95% of people who have been abducted by aliens have no idea it happened. He hypnotizes people to make them remember if they fit a certain profile. Active in the peace movement, convinced UFOs are real, pursue a spiritual path of enlightenment, and have psychic ability. ETs are interested in us because the Earth is going through a crisis phase that's very interesting to the rest of the galaxy, Hardis said. And I think some are trying to guide us to a better way of life. Harder also says skeptics are threatened by the idea of something smarter than them lurking out there. Philip J. Class, former editor of Aviation Week magazine and author of books debunking UFO claims, also thinks people who believe they were abducted are responding to hypnotic suggestion. He suspects many are just looking for a little celebrity. Class, who has spent 25 years investigating UFO claims, has a standing offer to pay $10,000 US, which is, at the time, $12,788 Australian, to any abductee, provided the Federal Bureau of Investigation backs up the story. No one has come forward so far. UFO believers accuse the FBI and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of a massive cover-up dating back to the 1940s. Staff said... It appears the government has one or more vehicles in addition to bodies, but they've locked people up, brainwashed them, and maybe even terminated them. So we can't be expected to produce hard evidence. And at the bottom it says KRD. KRD? Not sure what that means, but there it is. And I must say that uh, the fad for talking about or reporting being abducted by spaceships has um, largely disappeared. I do remember in past decades there was a lot of talk about it, but now it's uh, like UFOs themselves, really. It's more or less a relic of the past. And finally, we come to the pages of the Daily Telegraph, published in Sydney on the 21st of October, 1950. We're skipping about all over the 20th century at the moment. By Barry Lawrence, all the world loves dragons and bunyips. And in case it doesn't mention it in the story, a bunyip is a mythical Australian uh, creature. Last week, police at Wee War, New South Wales, announced that a swamp monster, which alarmed local people for six weeks, was just a bird. They said it was a bittern a bird which makes a hollow bellowing sound while it searches for food in the night. Sounds the bird made gave rise to a belief that a monster was prowling the wee war marshes. Some said that it was a crocodile, others that it was a bunyip. Women and children stayed home at night. Men patrolled the marshes with rifles. People reported that they had seen tracks which only a crocodile could have made. Somebody produced evidence that soldiers had released baby crocodiles in the district some years ago. After six weeks of excitement, the news that the monster was a harmless bird seemed rather disappointing. For, let's face it, everybody loves a monster. Since the dawn of human reasoning, the night and the unknown have been peopled with ghosts and wraiths, sinister goblins and terrifying monsters. We are parting with them reluctantly. In Ireland, where the Celtic twilight still lingers, they have their leprechauns and banshees, water horses and water bulls. In the Scottish Western Isles, folk still believe in seal men and seal women. In the north of England, they talk of the Lambton Worm, which can stretch seven times around a hill and eat all the sheep for miles around. Throughout West and Central Europe, belief in vampires and werewolves, 
human beings who magically turn into wolves, persists strongly. Norwegians still beware the kraken, a frightful sea monster, when they go fishing. Canadians occasionally see a sheep come serpent monster, which they call the Ogopogo. Mediterranean people still believe in Dijons, ghouls, satyrs, sirens. Hard-headed Scots dowling refuse to allow their tourist-attracting Loch Ness monster to be debunked. And Australia, youngest nation of all, stays in the picture with the bunyip. Civilized people from all over the world love Frankenstein and Dracula films and like to read about lost valleys where prehistoric monsters still live. Fantastic monsters troop through fiction and comic strips. Most of the old-time monsters or dragons have a beautiful and chaste maiden in thrall waiting to be rescued by a knight errant with a sharp lance or magic spell. St. George and the Dragon is a classic example, and the We War monster had something in common with it. The women and children menaced by the monster stayed at home, while the men, armed with rifles instead of lances and ingenious crocodile traps instead of the old-time magic and cantrips, word spells, sailed forth to do battle. This week, Professor W. M. O'Neill, Professor of Psychology at Sydney University, told us his opinion about why everybody loves a monster. It is the simple mental process of projecting our fears and baser impulses onto something outside ourselves, said Professor O'Neill. We like monsters because they are uglier than we are, more vicious, more secretly menacing, more antisocial. We personify them as animals, animal-like, or bestial, because their repulsiveness is a crystallization of those submerged instincts in us which we are taught to regard as uncivilized or animal. For example, the professor said, we project our baser instincts onto animals when we give them names like dingo, rat, and snake in the grass to people whose characteristics we dislike. The modern expression, wolf, he said, as applies to a man who lusts indiscriminately after women, is a good example of bestial personification. The human wolf of today is a recognisable survival of the goat-legged stayer of the ancients. In other respects, Professor O'Neill added, present-day monsters and bunyips were survivals of the dragons, ogres, and monstrous myths of our ancient folklore. I asked the professor why nobody believed in good fairies anymore, but so many still like to believe in monsters, the equivalent of bad fairies. In the first place, he said, monsters, dragons, ogres, and such like represent evil in folklore, and the nice fairies represent good. Later on, as the myths and fairy tales pass through the sieve of general public education, this simple symbolism was modified, and prevailing optimism or pessimism determined the balance of power between the good and the bad myths. It may be a reflection on the times that we live in that only the monster symbol of pessimism persists in our fancy. We don't like having our monsters debunked. When they fade inevitably into myth and legend, we obstinately retain them in folklore and fairy tale, pantomime and carnival. The We War Crocodile will return. He will show up as a bunyip in the back blocks or as a sea monster at a coastal resort. You can't keep a good monster down. Now that is a very interesting article from 1950 because we still see the same sort of thing going on today. And, uh, we might think of the various times here in the hinterland of Sydney up into the mountains that people over the years report seeing panthers or cougars or lions and things like that. Uh, and these creatures, of course, are, are never brought forward or any uh, evidence of their existence. Still, people swear they see them.
So there we go, a few interesting little odd eclectic bits and pieces of news connected with the paranormal, the supernatural, the strange over the decades. And don't forget, you too can spend a happy hour or two sifting through the many thousands upon thousands of reports, magazines, journals, and so on. Discoverable at trove at trove.nla.gov.au and you never know what monsters you might find. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast, and thank you to those people who continue to support the show at skepticzone.tv, either by Patreon or PayPal, or occasionally the once-off very generous gift. And thank you very much to uh, an unknown, <laughs> an unknown benefactor. You know who you are. Thank you very much. Well, I wonder how your week has been going so far. Lots of running around, lots of dividing your time between work and whatever you have to do. Well, I certainly hope the Skeptic Zone gives you maybe a pause during the daytime, or do you listen to it while you're busy running around doing other things? Maybe you're in the garden. Maybe there's a nice red rose in the garden. People do all sorts of things listening to the Skeptic Zone. If you're on a long drive, I hope the show keeps you entertained, keeps you going to get to your destination. Whatever you're doing, I thank you very much for listening. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the beautiful state of Oregon here in the United States. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter, at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Arda also says skeptics are threatened by the idea of something smarter than them lurking out there. <laughs> oh, yes, very threatened. <laughs> oh, dear. <clears throat> <laughs>